Hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Um, today we're going to talk to you a bit about uh, the economics of cybersecurity, uh, sort of the economic analysis of cybersecurity uh, legislation and regulation. So there's been a lot of um, really strong rhetoric uh, sur surrounding cybersecurity. Um, when we think about passing cybersecurity legislation, we're doing it uh, because we perceive that there is a threat. Uh, and that the way that threat has been described uh, has been has been done so in very heated language, right? So when we ask uh, what is the threat, uh, uh, here's how some proponents of cybersecurity legislation talk about it, right? So here is Leon Panetta, uh, Secretary of Defense, at his uh, confirmation hearing in June. He says, "I have often said that there is a strong likelihood that the next Pearl Harbor that we confront could very well be a cyber attack that cripples our power systems." our grid, our security systems, our financial systems, our governmental systems, right? So the next Pearl Harbor could be a cyber attack. Remember, Pearl Harbor, we had several thousand Americans uh, die. Here is Senator Carl Levin. Uh, cyber weapons and cyber attacks potentially can be devastating, approaching weapons of mass destruction in their effects, right? So the idea here is that a cyber attack could have the same effect as a nuclear detonation. Here's Senator Rockefeller just a few months ago introducing uh, legislation. The prospect of mass casualty is what has propelled us to make cybersecurity a top priority for this year. Admiral Mike Mullen, former Joint Chiefs Chairman, said that a cybersecurity threat is the only other threat that is on the same level as Russia's stockpile of nuclear weapons. All right, so cyber weapons being on the same level of, uh, uh, of threats as nuclear weapons. Here is Stephen Chabinsky, who is Deputy Assistant Director of the FBI Cyber Division. Is, uh, he was speaking at a recent cybersecurity uh, conference. Uh, he says, quote, the cyber threat can be existential, can be an existential threat, meaning it can challenge our country's very existence or significantly alter our nation's potential. Again, the idea being that cyber threats could wipe America off the map, could challenge our very uh, existence. So this is very, very uh, strong rhetoric, and the media uh, has also uh, contributed to this reporting, uh, uh, this sort of rhetoric. Um, so th this is a very strong claim that the cyber threat that we face, that we're trying to address with legislation, is a threat that is, would result in mass casualty, uh, you know, is, a, is a similar to WMD or nuclear weapons, um, very strong uh, language. So what we have to ask ourselves is, well, what is the evidence? What is the evidence that the threat that we face, and no doubt there is a threat out there, is the sort of threat that's being described with this kind of rhetoric? So when you ask folks, um, uh, well, what's, what's the, what is the threat? Uh, you know, what is it that you want to address with, uh, or what, what is the threat that you say would uh, cause this kind of uh, effect? Well, they'll point to several things. They'll point to the sort of cyber attacks that we have seen. So what do they say? Well, first of all, they'll point to denial of service attacks. All right, so denial of service attacks is when you have uh, uh, a server that is overwhelmed with requests for information. All right, in many cases, this will be a website that is flooded with traffic, uh, so much so that the website is shut down. And uh, this is something that's very bad, it's very inconvenient, and it's something that happens uh, actually quite often, probably every day. Some uh, attacks are more uh, noticeable than others, right? So you have U.S. Telecom being taken down by uh, Anonymous this week. Uh, you had the Senate's website taken down over the summer. But ultimately, uh, denial of service attacks do not result in mass casualty or any casualties or injuries uh, at all. Uh, at most, what you get from a denial of service attack is a website being down for a few hours, maybe a day. Uh, uh, that is it. Then folks will point to cyber espionage, which again is very real and happens uh, very frequently, uh, uh, unfortunately, um, and it's a, it's a serious problem. But from cyber espionage, again, it, it does not pose the sort of risks that are often talked about. Cyber espionage does not result in uh, injury or death or mass casualties. Then folks will talk about uh, sort of kinetic cyber weapons. This will be cyber attacks that can actually have a physical effect at the end, you know, so you can send a message over the network that will have a physical effect at the end. So now we're talking, you know, this is serious, this could cause injury uh, or death. 
So when you say, okay, well, what sort of cyber uh, weapons with kinetic effect have we, have we seen? What is the evidence that this is a real threat? Uh, well, they'll point to several instances of this. So one is they'll point to a uh, blackout in Brazil in 2007 uh, that was reported to be the result of a cyber event. Uh, what we need to know about this blackout, however, is that after investigation, it turns out this was not a cyber event uh, whatsoever. This was not caused by a cyber attack. It was caused by a fire a few miles down from the uh, electrical plant, the power plant. But even looking at this blackout as a blackout, it did not result in deaths. It did not result in panic or terror. It resulted in inconvenience, uh, but pretty soon things were back to normal. Folks then will point to the Aurora Project, which was a simulation uh, that was done at Idaho National Labs. And what they did, engineers there uh, took a uh, this giant million dollar power generator that would be used in a power plant and they set it up and uh, they went a few miles up the road and were able to hack into the control system for that generator and were essentially caused it to destroy itself. And you can go on YouTube and see videos uh, of this and the machine doesn't blow up uh, exactly but it begins to sort of shake uncontrollably and, and, and start to, to fall apart. And, and so this is definitely a proof of concept that uh, a, a cyber weapon can have a kinetic effect. Right? You can hack into a system and cause it to have physical damage that could injure somebody, could kill somebody. But the thing to know about the Aurora Project is that it was uh, done on range at Idaho National Labs. It was a simulation, and the engineers who set it up, the, the, uh, who hacked in, had been the ones who set up the generator, so they knew exactly what they were uh, hacking into. And also, uh, they allowed the generator to uh, destroy itself. It had this been a real power plant, at the first notice, first, you know, first notice that uh, something was going awry here, what you'd probably expect is for an operator there to pull a safety and allow the machine to shut down. It wouldn't have been allowed to, uh, to destroy itself. Uh, next, folks will point to the incident at Marushi Shire, which uh, happened in Queensland, uh, uh, Australia. And what happened there is that uh, you had a disgruntled employee, actually it was somebody who was denied a job uh, by the city, hack in to the control system for the sewage department. And he, yes, and he uh, opened up uh, the valves and allowed sewage to spill out uh, into the town. It uh, spilled into a golf course and a uh, property of a hotel, and it was pretty terrible. Uh, but again, this was bad, uh, it was stinky, there was a real inconvenience for the folks there, but there was no injury, there was no death. So again, I, uh, with the Aurora Project, of course, there was no injury, there was no, uh, no death. And the other thing to know about the Maruchi Shire incident is that the person who, um, who hacked in and did this was a person who designed the control system. Okay? So this was uh, a private contractor who had designed the control system, he then applied for a uh, job at the city, the city denied it to him out of revenge, he hacked into the system that he had designed. Right. Um, so what does this tell you? Uh, like the Aurora Project, Maruchi Shire, having very specific knowledge about the uh, system that you're hacking into is sort of necessary for this kind of attack of a control system. And then finally, you've got Stuxnet, which we all, I'm sure, are pretty familiar with. This was uh, an attack, it was a worm that was used to uh, sabotage Iran's uh, nuclear processing capability. Uh, again, uh, this is something that resulted in no injuries, no casualties, uh, no deaths. Uh, something to know about Stuxnet is that it infected, uh, it has infected and it currently infects thousands of uh, Windows machines around the world. But they have no effects on those machines except on the ones who were the target. Right? Again, having very specific intelligence about the target is necessary to, uh, uh, to uh, have that sort of attack. And the way that the attack happened, it didn't, you know, it wasn't like the Aurora project, right? It didn't shake the machines uncontrollably and destroy them to sabotage them. It was trying to be imperceptible. It was trying to go undetected for as long uh, as possible. So what can we conclude uh, from the evidence of, uh, of, the, of the cyber attacks that we, that we know of? Well, none of these, not denial of service, not espionage, not the kinetic cyber attacks uh, that we know about, lend support to the uh, overheated rhetoric that we hear about cybersecurity. There is a wide diversion between the cyber dune scenarios 
that we hear and the few incidents of actual cyber attack that we have witnessed uh, so far. Now, another point I want to make is that I think that we underestimate uh, how resilient we are to even, uh, e even in the face of actual serious cyber attacks. So let me be clear. Uh, I'm not saying that a kinetic cyber attack isn't possible because clearly it is. We have proof of concept. Uh, in fact, there will probably be a cyber event in the future. But I think the probability of a cyber uh, attack is overestimated. And also, I think that the severity may be overestimated as well. And the reason is that we are incredibly resilient. So recently, uh, the White House put on for senators a simulation of a cyber attack that caused a blackout in New York City. This was, I think, last month. And it's classified, so uh, we don't know what it covered. Um, I don't know if it covered a mass casualty event that resulted in thousands uh, dead. But we can look at the evidence of actual blackouts in New York City, right? Starting with a series of blackouts uh, in the 1930s, going through the 1970s there were blackouts, and going on through uh, in 2003, the Northeast uh, blackout. In each case, there was no panic, there were few of any deaths, and the power and other services were restored relatively quickly. Jim Lewis of uh, CSIS, who's a cybersecurity expert, uh, has pointed out that, quote, the widespread blackout did not degrade U.S. military capabilities, did not damage the economy, and caused neither casualties nor terror. You know, large modern economies are hard to defeat. Their vulnerability to cyber attack or to dirty bombs or other exotic weapons is routinely exaggerated. Yes, computer networks uh, are vulnerable to attack, but nations are not equally vulnerable. Countries like the U.S., with an abundance of services and equipment and the ability to, uh, and the experience uh, in restoring critical functions, are well equipped to overcome an attack. So, what does this all mean? It means don't panic, right? The threat of harm from cyberspace is real, but we shouldn't be panicking. When we panic, we make decisions out of fear. And when we make decisions out of fear, we run the risk of overreacting and making poor decisions. So now that we know that we shouldn't be so afraid of this sort of overheated rhetoric, we can take a deep breath and sort of think about analyzing uh, the threat that does exist much more clearly. So why do we think that we need regulation, right? The legislation that is now pr proposed is premised on the idea that we don't have enough cybersecurity today and that markets alone won't provide enough cybersecurity. So I think this is captured uh, very nicely in the report of the CSIS Commission uh, on Cybersecurity for the 44th Presidency, which is a very influential document in the movement for cybersecurity legislation. And this is the way they framed it. They said, it is undeniable that an appropriate level of cybersecurity cannot be achieved without regulation as market forces alone will never provide the level of security necessary to achieve national security objectives. So I think this captures the reason why we're looking at cybersecurity legislation now. Right? There are two premises uh, uh, that are embedded in here, two assertions. One is that right now we do not have the appropriate level of cybersecurity. Right? What is the appropriate level of cybersecurity? How do we find that out? So we don't have the appropriate level of cybersecurity. That's one assertion in this. The other is that market forces alone will never provide the appropriate level of cybersecurity. And so we need legislation. So what is the appropriate level of cybersecurity? Well, for that, Eli is going to come over and talk to us about some economics. All right, so I'm going to start off with kind of a, a stupid question, right? What is the optimal number of cyber events, right? So we, we can think about this question on uh, multiple levels, right? Uh, the first level we can think about is, let's suppose we have a magical genie, and the magical genie asks us, how many cyber events would you like to have? Um, so in that case, we would say zero, right? Um, so zero. But a more useful level to think about this question is, what should policy aim for? Right? What should policy aim for in terms of uh, the amount of n the number of cyber events, the amount of cybersecurity? Right? So, 
the optimal number of cybersecurity events is not zero, right? Um, so on the left of this chart, uh, I have some very bad things. Um, and the right column shows how many of them we have. Um, so uh, in 2010, there were uh, nearly 13,000 homicides. Uh, in 2009, there were 10.8 million motor vehicle accidents, uh, 33, uh, almost 34,000 traffic fatalities, and of course we've had seven Nickelback albums. Um, so now policy could do something about this, right? Um, it, could, it could lower these numbers. Uh, you know, in fact, we could get some of them to zero, right? I think that the motor vehicle accidents and traffic fatalities, we could get those to zero by banning driving. Um, it's, it's just not worth it, right? So, so if, if we're not gonna shoot for zero on those, then we have, to, we have a trade-off to make. <laughs> We have a trade-off of do we want to spend more resources, do we want to create more regulations and get those down, or do we want to maybe spend less money even and, and accept a higher number of those. Um, any politician who ran for office on the platform of getting homicides down to zero, you would think was crazy, right? It's, it's not gonna happen. Um, and uh, you know, we could, you could get Nickelback albums down to zero if you had like the NSA involved in like monitoring Canadian basements for like garage bands that are starting up. Um, but again, we're, you know, that's not gonna work. Uh, it's gonna be very costly. And so we as a society face a trade-off. Um, so it's not immediately apparent what the right trade-off is, is it? Uh, we don't know a priori um, what, what the best, uh, what the right number is for any of these, what policies should aim for. So that's one reason we have economics. This is what economists do. Um, economics gives us tools that we can use to think about trade-offs. Um, one thing that we can infer from the tools of economics is that uh, under many circumstances, um, markets make the best possible trade-offs. Um, we can prove this assertion rigorously if we're willing to make some strong assumptions. Um, but even if we're not willing to make those strong assumptions, uh, markets work really well most of the time. Uh, if you think about the market for shoes, um, you know, leather is an input in shoes. It's also an input in belts and jackets. Uh, so what's the right trade-off between using leather in shoes and, and leather in jackets and, and belts? I, I don't know, but I don't need to know because the market sort of takes care of that. The market uh, allocates uh, the resources uh, efficiently. Um, so since markets solve a lot of these problems for us, we have to ask ourselves about the asterisk, right? What, what, what does most of the time mean, right? So markets, there are some cases where markets arguably don't do everything perfectly. Uh, and some, some people allege that cybersecurity is one of those cases. Um, so we're gonna look at this and we're gonna see how well cybersecurity fits. So there are two conditions that have to hold uh, for markets to fail. And the first condition is that the person deciding on the trade-off um, has, uh, has to face different costs and benefits than society at large. Uh, this is what you've probably heard called an externality, right? Someone else has, there's some external cost or benefit that uh, the person deciding, the person deciding on the trade-off isn't factoring in. So a lot of people stop there and they say, ah, there's an externality, we have to regulate. Um, but this is just bad economics. So there's a second condition that also has to be true, which is that it's impossible to pay or incentivize the person uh, directly or indirectly to make a better choice. Um, so people forget about that condition a lot and therefore a lot, a lot of alleged market failures are not really market failures. Um, and so, what I want to do through the, for the rest of this talk is talk about some ways that markets come up with creative ways to pay or incentivize people to make the right choice. So there's basically three of them. Um, you can write a contract, you can create a firm, or you can use informal norms and institutions. So um, how does writing a contract work? Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, if you don't like the trade-off someone else is making, uh, you pay them to make a better one, right? Uh, the classic example here is uh, the case of trampled crops, right? So you have a, a farmer and a rancher who are neighbors, let's say. And, and suppose the rancher is building 
a fence to keep his cattle in. Um, and you know, he faces the trade-off. I can spend more resources on the fence, I can spend less resources on the fence. If I spend less resources on the fence, I can spend them, more of them elsewhere. So he might make, he might decide to build not a very good fence. Um, so these cattle might get through, uh, they might trample the neighbor's crops. So if that's the case, suppose that for, for whatever reason the law says, you know, the, the rancher is not liable. Um, it turns out that if, if the damage to the crops is extensive and if the fence is cheap, the farmer can just pay the rancher to build a fence, a, a better fence, right? They can just make a contract and say, I'll pay you this much money to build a better fence. Problem solved. Um, that's it. So there's no need for the government to get involved there. Um, this happens online all the time, too. Uh, instead of uh, contracts, sometimes we call them uh, terms of service, right? So some people worry that companies like Facebook uh, won't tell us about security breaches. And because they won't tell us about security breaches, they won't protect our data very carefully. Um, they don't have a very strong incentive to, to be secure, is what's argued. Um, so it actually turns out that in Facebook's terms of service, they promise to notify users of breaches. Um, so uh, you look at the terms of service, you see, well, I will be notified if there's a breach. I can be pretty sure that they're gonna take care not to uh, let, my, <coughs> let my data leak out. It'd be very embarrassing for them uh, if, if uh, that got out, that they were not being very secure. So um, again, uh, if, if they don't do that, if they don't notify us of a breach, we take them to court. Um, so markets solve this problem, right? The, the problem of we don't know what trade-off Facebook is making in terms of security. They solve that problem through uh, contracts. Uh, the second way that markets align incentives is by organizing resources into firms. Um, sometimes all you need is the right business model, right? So the classic example in economics is lighthouses. For 200 years, uh, economists said that the private sector would not supply lighthouses, right? It would not make the right trade-off between lighthouses and other stuff, in other words. And, well, why not, right? So, th so the argument that they made was that there's no way to exclude people from, who don't pay from using the lighthouse from the services of the lighthouse, right? So there's no way to make money building a lighthouse. Um, so finally, in the 1970s, a, a very clever economist did a study of lighthouses in Britain and found out that uh, a great number of them were built by the private sector. Hmm, how could this be? Um, so it turns out that they found the right business model. Um, so in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, um, the private lighthouses were vertically integrated with the private harbors. So there were one firm. So lighthouses and harbors, one firm. And the harbor, Basically, if you had a good lighthouse, you would capture more of the revenue in, in the form of your harbor. More people would stop at your harbor if you had a good lighthouse. So markets were able to align uh, those incentives. So this sort of, uh, this sort of dynamic happens on the internet as well. Um, we see it with ISPs. So for a given ISP, some customers are infected with viruses and some are not. And um, the ISP has to face a choice about whether to restrict internet access by infected users or, um, or whether to allow them to continue to inflict some modest harms on, on their neighbors, right? their internet neighbors, the other customers on the ISPs. Um, so if it were up to the infected customers, right, they would say, never cut me off. Right? I never want to be cut off. They would make the, the wrong trade-off. But the ISP has an incentive to maximize the value of its product, and that means cutting people off when they're causing too much damage, and that means letting them go if the damage is not very severe, and you know they're making a trade-off between security and support costs and quality of user experience. And um, so it turns out that you can, you can show that they, they probably strike the right balance. Uh, they, they cut off and they make a hard trade-off that users would not make on their own, but they, um, they police the network and they let some things slide that, that are not very serious. 
Um, finally, informal norms in institutions can get you a long way to, to repairing uh, incentives. Um, the classic example here comes from uh, Bob Ellickson's book, Order Without Law. He's a, a law professor, and he studies the norms that uh, have arisen uh, among the residents of rural Shasta County, California, uh, surrounding cattle trespass. So uh, there are laws in California that govern cattle trespass, but the residents in this county routinely ignore the laws. They just completely ignore them. Even the police ignore the laws there uh, surrounding cattle tr trespass. So the residents of this county just prefer to handle the disputes in a neighborly manner, what they consider to be a neighborly manner. Um, so for a first offense, you know, if some, someone's cattle tra uh, comes trespassing on your property, you, typically what happens there is they'll call the owner of the cattle and they'll say, um, you know, your cattle's here, I'll, I'll help you round them up. And, and they're just good neighbors. And then for future offenses, it sort of, sort of starts getting punished a little bit and mild gossip. Um, and if it continues for a very long time, then eventually some of the bulls get turned into steers, um, which is a little sad for them, but, uh, but it, it's effective punishment, right? It lowers the value of, of, the, of the cattle. So Ellickson argues that these norms serve people rather well. Uh, recourse to the law and claims for monetary relief are very rare there. Um, we see uh, something similar on the internet today in terms of uh, ISPs working together to track and reduce malware. Um, it's all very informal. It's based on relationships of trust between network security professionals. Um, and when one ISP feels like another ISP is not really doing a good job in fighting malware, they just disconnect from them, right? So one ISP will just disconnect from another one that's not behaving the way they want them to behave. It's called de-peering. It's sort of like the, the physical network's version of unfriending. Um, and it works very well to enforce the norms of, of what, is, uh, what is good security practice between ISPs. So uh, one final point um, that I wanted to make is that, you know, I've argued that markets work well. And uh, some, you know, some, sometimes maybe they don't work perfectly. But even if they don't work perfectly, even if people don't naturally have uh, the right incentive, and even if markets can't find creative ways to give them the right incentives, um, it's not clear that regulators can do better, right? Um, the regulators might not be able to select the right trade-offs. Uh, they might not know what the right trade-offs are. Uh, it's not, like I said, it's not immediately obvious what the right trade-offs are. And um, even if they know what the right trade-offs are, their incentives might not be to select exactly the right trade-offs. So we have to keep that in mind. You know, we're not comparing the market against perfect regulators. We're comparing the market against regulators that we have that are imperfect. And now I'll invite Jerry up for. Yeah, so I guess the, the punchline here is that really we have not seen any evidence uh, that there is a market failure in cybersecurity. Um, sure, there is an externality in cybersecurity uh, because, well, how would you describe it? What, how would you say that there is an externality in cybersecurity? It's a positive externality in effect, right? Right. So, so the benefits of of people uh, engaging in, in security practices are uh, are captured by other people besides just themselves. Right. But, so, but the incentives get aligned through mar the market mechanism. Right. And so, if uh, looking at critical infrastructure, which is what a lot of these bills look at, if uh, a nuclear power plant doesn't secure itself sufficiently, right? If, as the CSIS report would say, there's not an appropriate level of cybersecurity, and we're able to, you know, a, an attacker is able to blow up the nuclear power plant. You know, that's bad for the surrounding community, right? There, there is uh, a lot of destruction around there. So the question is, and what folks would say is, well, the privately owned nuclear power plant can't capture the benefits of protecting all of the surrounding community, and so therefore won't do it. But wait a minute. What about the investment that they've put into the power plant? They've spent, they've invested billions of dollars in the uh, power plant. They don't want to lose that investment. So don't they have an incentive already 
to protect it? And is that incentive enough to provide security, not just for their investment, but accept the fact that there will be a positive externality? Uh, so when we ask what is the appropriate level of cybersecurity, we haven't seen any evidence that there isn't uh, an appropriate level right now and that the market isn't providing that right now. Anything you want to add to that? Okay. So lastly, um, a lot of you probably came in here just wanting us to answer sort of this question, which bill? And uh, we want to stay away from that because uh, we'd like to suggest to you that maybe no bill is necessary. But I'll, I'll just say this. Uh, if you look at the, d the, the different bills that are really in competition right now, which is the Lieberman bill, the McCain bill, the Lundgren bill, the Rogers bill, uh, the Lieberman bill is the most regulatory. It's the one that actually goes out and sets standards and uh, tells uh, private networks how they should be secured. Uh, most regulatory. The Lundgren bill is a much better bill, in my opinion. Um, however, it still has, it still asks uh, sector-specific regulators to consider uh, uh, adopting uh, regulation for those uh, for the critical infrastructure that it uh, supervises. Then you have the McCain bill and the Rogers bill, and those are simply information sharing bills. They don't have any new regulations or any new spending attached to them. Uh, so that's where I'll leave it. I'll say this about the information sharing. Uh, I think Elon and I will agree that information sharing is great among private uh, actors. And by the way, what evidence is there that private actors are not sharing information now? They, they do seem to be doing that all the time. They have set up all sorts of robust systems to be in constant contact with each other in case of emergency. Uh, but there should also be uh, communication and sharing of information between private sector and government. Uh, and definitely the government has information that would be useful to the private sector. It should be sharing that as well. What we need to ask ourselves is, why is that sharing not just not happening now? Right? Um, and it seems that the answer to that is that there are certain laws that today uh, exist, that, you know, there are laws, or there are um, consumer privacy laws uh, that impede that sort of communication to some extent. And what these bills would do is that they would wipe away uh, the applicability of those laws to cybersecurity information. They say, notwithstanding any other uh, uh, law, you can share this information. That's a blunt instrument. Um, what I would say is, let's look for the laws that are preventing the, the right amount of sharing that we want, and then why not uh, reform those laws, right? So ECPA, the Electronic Communication Privacy Act, seems to be one of the laws that's standing of the way of some information sharing. Why don't we reform ECPA? Why have just a sweeping uh, uh, reform here? Um, and then finally, there are civil liberties uh, uh, considerations. We're not civil liberties experts, um, but just personally, I think we both are troubled about uh, the idea that uh, uh, the sharing provisions in these bills might be overly broad, might allow, for example, the NSA to have access uh, to information. The NSA has not had a great track record uh, uh, in as far as respecting civil liberties. So I would commend to you to look at the analysis of these bills from the Center for Democracy and Technology, uh, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, the Cato Institute, uh, the ACLU, and the Electronic Frontier Foundation. They've all done uh, really good analysis as far as the civil liberties implication of these bills go.